Hey guys, today it's time for me to wrap up my 2023 low buy. I am going to be sharing everything that I purchased in the second half of the year, quarter three and quarter four. I'll also share the total amount that I spent on makeup throughout the entire year and we're gonna revisit the goals I set for my low buy at the beginning of the year. First, let me go ahead and share everything I bought in quarter three and four. In quarter three from July through September, I only placed one order, made one purchase from Ulta and I did film a haul of those things, but I'll go ahead and quickly recap everything and maybe share updated thoughts on the products if I haven't yet reviewed them. So my one purchase in quarter three was from Ulta. I bought some drugstore makeup and I think they were having some sort of sale on drugstore products. It might have been their fall haul event or something like that, but a lot of things were discounted during this order. I bought 10 makeup items for a total of $67.48, which is a pretty good deal. Like that means on average I paid under $7 per item. The first couple things from that order were just replacements of my two favorite powders that I had run out of, the e.l.f. Halo Glow Loose Powder and the CoverGirl Clean Fresh Pressed Powder. I use them both almost every day, so very happy with that purchase. This was also when I bought the CoverGirl Clean Fresh Yummy Gloss. Actually, looking at this now, I've had it sitting upright um, on my table here, and I've already used up this much, so I'm glad to see I'm getting good use out of it. As I've said in previous reviews of this product, I like it. I do really enjoy the scent. This is in the shade You're Just Jelly, and this really does smell like a jar of strawberry jelly. No joke. Honestly, I think that's the main selling point of these glosses, is they have fun scents. Other than that, it's a very sheer version of this color, so it goes on looking pretty much clear on my lips. And it does give some nice shine, feels nice on the lips, but this formula, you do get strings between your lips when you open and close your mouth, so don't love that about it, but I'm still enjoying it though. Also bought two setting sprays during this order, and I shared in my products I regret buying video, I do regret buying this one, the Flower Beauty Seal the Deal Hydrating Setting Spray, just because I really don't like the sprayer. And also looking back, I'm like, why did I buy two setting sprays in one order? Like. I really did not need both of these. I really should have just bought the Makeup Revolution one. This is the Calming Makeup Fixing Spray, and I really do enjoy this one. This is just like a good everyday setting spray. It does help with staying power, and it also gives my face a little bit of a glow. And the flower one, I like the formula. It's really just the sprayer that I don't like. It does give a dewy finish, like it says, but at the same time, it's not like oily or anything. Like it, I feel like it does help with longevity as well, but the sprayer on this is so annoying. It like, I always get these huge droplets on my face, and it messes up the foundation underneath. So not a huge fan of that, but I do love the Revolution one. Another repurchase during this Ulta order was the Milani Anti-Gravity Mascara. And I actually didn't open this until just recently, even though I bought it in August. I opened it, I think like end of November. This was my favorite mascara of 2022. And now that I'm on my second tube of it, I'm not loving it anymore because this time around I'm getting flaking with this, which is really frustrating because the first time I had this, I swear to you, I never had flaking, smudging. Like that is always a deal breaker for me. I don't think they changed the formula. Maybe I just got an older one. I don't know, but I still love the effect it has on my lashes, but I don't love that it flakes. This ended up being one of my favorite products of the year, the Essence Pure Nude Baked Blush. This I got in the shade Shimmery Rose. I love this blush. This feels like a high-end formula with a drug store price and a similar amount of glow to the Milani baked blushes. It does kind of serve as a highlighter and a blush in one, which I like because it's just like a two-in-one step. Very easy to work with as well. The other blush from this order, fortunately this was a gift with purchase, but I have already decided to declutter this. This was another thing from my Products I Regret Buying video, the Makeup Revolution Super Dewy Liquid Blush. The shade of this is really pretty, but it's just such a pigmented formula, and I really, I don't like for my liquid blushes to be this pigmented because I just find they get blotchy and I end up applying too much. Um, I end up squeezing out too much and only using a little bit of it. It's just, it's too much of a hassle. So this was not for me, but this was a regret. Even though it was a gift with purchase, I still, I don't know. I wish I'd picked a different gift with purchase because I think it was buy three Makeup Revolution, get one free, and this was my free one. I wish I'd gotten something different, but oh well. The other Makeup Revolution thing I bought was the Eye Bright Corrector in Light to Medium. This is not really the color corrector for me, but I do still recommend it because I, I think like this is very similar to the Becca Under Eye Corrector. It has that kind of melty formula where you press it and it almost like melts onto your finger. Very tacky formula and very, very glowy. Like, 
this the glow from this will show through your powder on your under eyes which i don't love i did decide to keep this though because sometimes i do want a little brightening on the under eye and as long as i'm careful to use like only a very small amount of this i feel like i can make it work i can see the usefulness of it even though it's not like my number one i still like the sigma corrector better the last thing from that ulta purchase was the elf halo glow powder puff i'm really enjoying this and really just enjoying velour puffs in general but i have since tried one from makeup revolution this one i received their ad advent calendar in PR. I only ended up keeping like this and the sponge from that advent calendar. Everything else I ended up passing on because a lot of it wasn't even stuff that they sell as a regular part of their line and I was like this just doesn't really have a purpose in my collection I feel like. But this powder puff that came in that advent calendar I'm really enjoying. I looked it up and I think the one they sell individually is pink so I'm not sure if it's the exact same. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably just the same material but a different color. But my point is I like this one better than the e.l.f. one. This one has a much softer, more velvety feel and the e.l.f. one is almost more like a terry cloth material. It's not as smooth. I don't know if you can to see that but the elf one just has a little bit more texture to it and i also like the shape of the revolution one better because it comes to more of a point so it's nice for the under eyes that being said i'm still enjoying the elf one and i will continue to use it and um it cleans up really well i just wash it the same way that i wash my sponges with a little bit of dr bronner's bar soap and it cleans up beautifully i've also heard you can toss these in the washing machine haven't tried that yet because i do feel like that would probably be a little bit rougher on them so that was everything from quarter three quarter four was my biggest spending quarter of the year i think it was that way last year as well. I spent $198.54 in quarter four, so basically $200, which was by far the most I spent out of any quarter of this year. Makes sense to me because usually this time of year, like, there are more makeup releases. Also, in the earlier half of this year, we were preparing to move, so I really was being very particular about what I bought. I mean, I still am pretty particular about what I buy, but especially in the earlier part of this year, I was like barely buying anything. But in quarter four, I loosened up a little bit, bought some new stuff. So in October, I actually made three separate Ulta purchases. They were all for the same video though. If you remember, I did a video where I tested products that you recommended to me, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to finally share my follow-up thoughts on those products. I was going to do a speed reviews, but I figured I would just go ahead and lump those speed reviews into this video because a lot of the products that were going to be in my next speed reviews video are these things. First up, I made an in-store Ulta purchase for $21.58. I bought three things. I was trying to find as many things as I could that you guys recommended to me in-store, but I only found like a few things. Everything else I had to buy online. But one of the in-store purchases was the Ulta Beauty Lustrous Foil Eyeshadow in the shade Rose Gold Leaf. And I think I used a 20% off coupon on this in-store purchase. This is really nice if you like very foiled toppers. Kind of messy. I did go ahead and keep the little plastic like stopper, I don't know if that's what you would call it, that presses it down because I've heard that this breaks easily and it has almost like a creamy feel to it. It is kind of thick and you do have to be careful, like you really only need to tap a little bit onto your finger and it does have some fallout. So it's not necessarily the most foolproof product, but it is gorgeous. It gives like a wet foiled look to the eyes. I've used it on its own or as a topper. The next thing from that in-store purchase was the LA Girl Pro Prime Cream Eyeshadow Primer. This wasn't recommended by a subscriber. I was just looking for a new eyeshadow primer and I did not like this one. This was also in my products I regret buying video. Really wish I had skipped this, even though it was only $4.79 I paid for it. I still wish I would have skipped it. it. just doesn't work well. I would get creasing with this. It has like way too greasy of a texture. Also from that in-store purchase, I bought the Milani Under Eye Brightener in the shade Rose. I am still not sure how I feel about this actually. This one has a sponge tip and it does get really messy in the cap so I don't love that. This is very interesting though. It has a thin whipped texture almost. I do like the texture of it much better than the Makeup Revolution Under Eye Corrector. This one's one of those really sticky emollient ones. This one is much more thin, doesn't have so much glow to it. I guess the thing I feel like is missing from this is coverage. This really doesn't have coverage. A lot of times like I'm using a color corrector to correct my under eyes, but I'm also using it to just boost the coverage of my concealer a little bit. 
and I don't feel like this does that. So I do like the kind of peachy brightness that it gives my under eyes, and I also like this color because I feel like it blends into my blush really nicely. I guess I just wish it had more coverage. Definitely something that I will keep and continue using though. So those were the three things from my first Ulta order of Q4, and those totaled to $21.58. So then later that day, I went online and ordered the rest of the things that I couldn't find in store, and most of these again were for my video testing subscriber recommendations. The bulk of the cost of this order came from these three palettes. I did purchase three palettes at one time, which is very out of character for me, but I'm gonna blame you guys because all three of these palettes were highly requested for me to try, so yeah, it's your fault. I'm just kidding. So I did buy both of the new Flower Beauty Lights palettes, Garden Lights and Coastal Lights, to be honest, I really dropped the ball on both of these. I have not been using them very much at all since I bought them. That being said, I have used them a handful of times and have really enjoyed them. It is the same formula and texture as Desert Lights and Jungle Lights, both of which have been favorites of mine for a couple years now. The Coastal Lights one has more satin shades though. All three of these top shades in here have more of a satin finish. You can see they're really not nearly as foiled looking as the ones in Garden Lights. These three shades on the bottom row are more metallic, especially this taupe down here, but the three top shades are much more muted, more of like a subtle satiny shimmer. So this one is a little bit different from the previous Flower Lights palettes in that way but the Garden Lights one has that same foiled finish in all the shades. Honestly, I think a big reason why I haven't used these a ton is I bought them in the middle of the fall, and I do feel like both of these color stories really, they feel more spring to me, especially coastal lights, like these pastels. These look like spring colors. I do have the Garden Lights one in my holiday palette basket right now, and I have used that middle shade like for a gold, like sparkly holiday look. I don't know why they released these in the fall. I mean, you know, I I'm sure there's a reason, but I think that's why I probably haven't been super inspired by these colors, because these just aren't really, they, they, they're, they aren't really fall and winter colors to me. Also bought the I Need a Nude palette in this order. This was the most expensive item in probably the most expensive item I've bought this entire year. And I did film a one week one palette with this that I'll link below. I have to say, I don't think this palette is worth it unless you wear taupe eyeshadow all the time. It's just not as versatile as I would hope for such an expensive palette. And I guess I should have known that going into it because I mean, you know, just looking at it, it clearly is a lot of taupe, but I was surprised when I got this in person to see just how similar some of the shades are to each other. Like these two matte light taupe shades, stone and mesh are almost identical. I feel like they could have easily left one of those out of here and replace it with something different. And then these two taupe shimmers, Ella and Filigree, I also feel like those are so similar. I do like that there are some peachier shades in here and a pink as well, so it's not just all taupe, but I feel like a lot of the shades I get with this palette end up looking very similar. Fortunately, I do really like taupe and I wear it a lot, so I think I'm still going to get a lot of use out of this palette but I don't know if it's really worth $69. I also feel like I, I like the shimmers in here better than the mattes. I do feel like the mattes can be a little bit patchy and skippy on me. Some of them don't like to stick to the crease area of my eye. I guess the longer I've had this, the more I've just felt kind of like, wow, I really spent almost $70 on this, huh? It is really pretty. I do like the packaging. Um, and don't get me wrong, like, the color story is gorgeous. I love the colors in here. It's just I don't feel like it's worth the price. Also from that order, I bought the ColourPop Pretty Fresh Concealer. Surprisingly, I'm really not loving this. And I'm surprised because the ColourPop Pretty Fresh Foundation is my favorite foundation of all time. Legitimately, like, if I could only have one foundation, it would be that one. This concealer, on the other hand, I don't know what it is. Now, to be completely fair, <laughs> I bought the shade Fair 20N. I should have gotten Fair 30N. I don't know what I was thinking because I wear Fair 30N in the foundation and I know I like a skin tone match. I don't really like to go brighter with my concealer than my foundation. But I, I guess the reason I went with this shade is because I looked at um, Foundation, which is a website where you can put in products that do match your skin tone and it'll let you know what shade to get in a different product. The shade it recommended to me for some reason was Fair 20 and I won't say it's too light because I can definitely make it work. Like I said, this is what I have on my under eyes right now and I don't think it's too light for me to wear. Just keep that in mind. I do feel like sometimes when a concealer is a little bit lighter on me, I don't end up liking it as much. But even taking the shade out of the equation, I do not like the way this sits on my under eyes. I feel like it just looks so dry and it will also accentuate dryness on my under eyes that I didn't even know was there. Most of the time I don't really have dry patches on my under eyes, but when I wear this, I suddenly do have dry patches. <laughs> 
it's weird. This is what I'm wearing today with the Milani Conceal and Perfect. I feel like from far away it looks okay, but up close it's looking really bad. <laughs> Not gonna lie, like, it looks so dry. Maybe if I had gone a shade up, I would like it more, but I, I definitely don't think I would like it more than my favorite concealer, which is the NYX Bear With Me. Then I got the Essence Brighten Up Banana Powder. This is a really light translucent powder, and it does have just, like, the palest of pale yellow undertones. I am not completely sold on this powder. For one thing, it is really hard pressed, so in order to pick up enough powder to like effectively set my under eyes, I do have to really work my brush in there, which isn't the biggest deal. But there have been some times where I've gotten just way too light of an under eye look with this. Like I apply this and it's just so light. And I think it's because I'm applying too much powder. But if I pick up less powder, then I feel like I'm not able to get an even layer on my under eye. And so some parts will still be kind of not fully set. And I really don't like that. So I've only used this as an under eye powder. They do say on the back here, you can use it on the under eyes or on the face, like the high points of the face, as a brightening banana powder. I guess I'll try that next. I just don't know if banana powders are really for me. I feel like like the yellow can have a little bit of a color correcting effect if you have purple undertones on your under eyes, uh, which I do. But I think for my color correcting, I prefer to just use a color corrector rather than a powder. But I don't I know a lot of people really like this though, so maybe, maybe I'm missing something. I'm definitely not gonna give up on it yet. This one I'm so sad about. This is the Ulta Beauty New Heights Lifting Mascara. If you saw the video where I tested subscriber recommendations, this was one of them. And I was so impressed in that video because I love this wand. This is the best wand I've ever seen in a mascara. I want I want more mascaras to have a wand like this. So very small wand, silicone bristles. I love how much control I get with this brush. I don't usually love really big mascara wands. This one is so nice because you can get like those little bitty hairs in the inner and outer corners. You can be just so precise with this. And it makes my lashes look amazing. It really is lifting and lengthening. I love the way it looks. Sadly, this transfers actually a lot on me, like more than most mascaras that transfer. I will even get transfer up on my brow bone from my lashes, which almost never happens to me with other mascaras. So I've really only been using this like when I'm doing my makeup just for fun, like at night, and I know I'm gonna be washing off my face in a few hours. So I don't care if my mascara lasts, but man, I am so sad because I would love this mascara if it weren't for the smudging. But if anyone knows of other mascaras that have a similar small brush like this, let me know because I I have a newfound obsession with this style of wand. Also part of that order, I bought the Essence Extreme Lasting Eye Pencil in Silky Nude. This is a great color for me to wear in the waterline to brighten my eyes, and it is very brightening. The problem is I don't feel like it lasts in my waterline very well. To be fair, most things don't. I feel like most things are not gonna stay in the waterline for, for very long, but it really does wear off of my waterline pretty quickly. There will still be some like close to my lashes, but it's really not as waterproof as it says it is. I'll still use it if I want to just quickly brighten up the under eyes, but it is the kind of thing like, I'm taking this barcode sticker off. But I feel like, you know, I would have to bring this with me and reapply it if I wanted to maintain that look. The last two things from that order were both lip products. One was for the video testing subscriber recommendations. This was the e.l.f. O Face Satin Lipstick. And even though I've said I've kind of not been in much of a lipstick mood recently, I'm really enjoying this one. Actually, this is what I have on my lips right now. Great nude brown color. And I can see why this formula is so popular. I think this is meant to be a dupe for the NARS lipsticks, which I haven't tried, but it does feel really nice and luxe. It has like a magnetic closure as well. So even though I was complaining about the price of these, because I do feel like $9 is pretty up there for an e.l.f. product, they've definitely upped the quality. But this is a very comfortable formula. It's creamy. It has a little bit of a satin finish, um, but it's actually really long wearing as well. I feel like I usually get about four or five hours of wear out of this, which is pretty good for a, a bullet lipstick. I don't really know what my line of thinking was with this one. I don't know why I bought this, honestly. <laughs> but this is the Ulta Beauty Tinted Juice Infused Lip Oil in the shade Bougie Beige. I thought this was a gift with purchase, but then I looked back and it wasn't. I spent $7 on this. Maybe Ulta was having like a buy to get to half off or something like that because I did also buy the um, Ulta brand mascara. I think there was some kind of Ulta deal going on that explains this random <laughs> lip purchase. Um, but this is interesting. I actually had the 
regular, like the original Ulta juice infused lip oil years ago, the clear one, and I really liked it. And so it's been interesting to try the tinted version because this to me feels completely different. This actually is very pigmented. Like they call it tinted. Um, this is like a full coverage lip color. And it is a really pretty milky pinky beige. I love the color. Sadly, this is one of those lip products that bothers my throat. So I had to stop using it even though I do like the color a lot. It doesn't really feel like a lip oil to me. It more feels like an opaque lip gloss. I really wish I could keep wearing this though because I love a light nude pink gloss like this. I think it's really pretty. But these were the last two lip products I bought and I really am trying not to buy any more lip products for a while just until I can figure out what's going on with whatever this allergy, if it even is an allergy, I don't know. I pretty much put myself on a lip product no-buy at this point. So that was everything from the big online Ulta order that added up to $150. I actually ended up going in store to buy one more thing for that video. I know, crazy. But um, this was $5, the Essence Baby Got Blush Cream Blush Stick. I'm liking this, but I wouldn't say it's a favorite. Um, I, I will say I do feel like I have to be careful with this because it does contain coconut oil. So I try not to use it too many days in a row because coconut oil often does break me out. I haven't noticed this breaking me out when I just wear it like one time, haven't had any problems, but I think if I were to wear it like every day for a week, I might start to see some breakouts. I don't know. I feel like for $5, like it's, it's fine. Like it is a really pretty blush. It's got a little bit of a dewy glow to it. No shimmer to this, but um, a nice dewy finish. I do find I have to either pick it up on a brush or apply it to my hand first and then apply it to my cheeks. It's not really the kind of blush that you can just swipe directly on your cheeks or it will go patchy and lift up your foundation. It's fine, but not a favorite. So after all of that, I definitely slowed down my spending because I only bought two more things for the rest of the year. In November, I bought one item and it was the Milani eyeshadow primer. I just bought this like at Walmart and I think I spent about $8 on it. Very happy with this one. This one I loved years ago. I really wish I would have bought this instead of the LA Girl eyeshadow primer. From now on, I think when, when it comes to eyeshadow primers, I'm, I'm probably just going to stick to this one or other ones that I've tried that I know work because I really don't need to try new ones and be disappointed when I know what works. The last purchase I bought in Vegas from Sephora, I got the mini Rare Beauty liquid blush. This had been on my wish list for a while and when I saw they came out with a mini version, I was so excited because I feel like the full size is huge and it would take me forever. Like I would never use it up. So I was really happy to see that they came out with a mini version. This is in the shade Hope, which I think is the only shade they sell in like an, an individual mini. I know they've had like gift sets before with other shades, but Hope, honestly, I think this is the shade I would have gotten if I had to choose from the full size anyway. I've only used this a few times, so I don't have a full review to give on this yet, but um, I'll definitely continue to update you on that. So that is everything I bought in Q3 and Q4. Now let's take a look at the purchase caps that I set at the start of this year. So if you remember, this year I decided to set a limit for how many things I would allow myself to buy in each category. And then two categories were replacement only, which was eyeshadow primer and mascara. So let's take a look and see how well I did on this. So if we add up all of my purchase caps for every category, the total came out to 60 products total. So the goal was to purchase no more than 60 items for the year. And I ended up buying a total of 36 items. Um, and this does not include tools, so sponges, powder puffs, those sorts of things. I don't have a category for those, so I'm not counting those towards this number. There were three categories that I went over by one item, and those were concealer, powder, and eyeshadow palettes. So for the year, I set a limit for two concealers, and I did purchase three, and I'm counting color correctors as part of this. So two of the three were color correctors, and then one was a concealer. So I did go over in that category technically by one. And then for powder, my purchase cap was three and I bought four. My eyeshadow palette limit was five and I bought six. So I did go over slightly in those categories. But as I said at the start of the year, these were pretty loose numbers. Like I wasn't so set on being exact with all of them. I said if I went over by one, it was fine as long as I was under in other categories. There were two other categories where I reached the limit exactly and then every other category I was under. So. I think that balances out to be satisfactory in my opinion, especially since I only bought 36 out of the total 60 that I was allowed to. I'm also really happy to say there were six categories where I didn't end up buying anything, so I didn't even come close to reaching my limit. Those categories were primer, highlighter, brow products, eyeshadow, duos, trios, and quads. That's one category. 
magnetic singles, and liquid eyeshadow. So all of those categories, I didn't buy anything. The two categories where I did reach the limit were setting spray, I bought two out of two, and then potted single eyeshadows, I bought three out of three. And then everything else, I stayed below my limit. The two replacement only categories were eyeshadow primer and mascara, and I didn't technically stick to the replacement only rule for mascara. The two mascaras I purchased this year, I didn't technically need to buy them because I had other mascaras that I was using. I didn't run out of mascara this year, so I did not stick to my mascara rule at all, but that's okay. And then the eyeshadow primer category, I did buy two when I also technically didn't run out of eyeshadow primer, but I was replacing one that I didn't like, the Rare Beauty eyeshadow primer I bought last year, but I opened it this year and I really it was just not working for me at all. And with this category, like, I just, I need something that works. So I, like I said, I do wish that I would have just gone back to the one that I knew would work instead of trying a new one, the LA Girl one, which, surprise, surprise, didn't end up working. I guess I did end up unnecessarily purchasing one thing in this category, but overall, I still feel good about all of that. Now, I also want to share the total amount that I spent on makeup this year, and I'm happy to say it's actually less than last year. Last year's total was 510 and this year's total was 479. That's how much I spent on makeup for the entire year. Um, makeup as well as makeup tools and makeup related things. Now I do want to point out that I don't count PR towards my low buy totals because really this was just a way for me to track my own spending and put better spending habits into practice, which I have been doing low buys of some form of a low buy, I think for the past three years on my channel. And I feel like in doing so, I've really like, I've been able to put really solid, like mindful spending habits into practice. And I don't really feel like I need to impose those strict rules and guidelines on myself anymore because I've I've learned the lessons of, of a low buy, right? Like I feel like my spending is pretty under control right now. And I've also been doing a lot of thinking about whether or not it really makes sense to do a low buy or no buy as a YouTuber or content creator when you're also receiving a fair amount of PR. I've always been open to PR. In fact, you know, I've, I've been receiving some PR in some form for several years now, but as my channel has grown, of course, the PR has increased. And this year I would say was the first year that it was really consistently coming in. Like probably I'm getting at least a package a week most of the time. So it's definitely coming in more consistently. And I'm always so incredibly grateful for the PR that I receive. Like every time I receive a package, I'm just like, it feels surreal still, but I am really particular about the PR that I actually end up keeping. I would say more than half of the PR I get, I end up passing along to friends, family, or donating because even with PR, I still want to be discerning about what I am allowing into my permanent collection. And I only want to bring things into my collection that are really going to be useful or going to serve a purpose in my collection. So that's where I stand on PR. But this year I was feeling kind of weird about posting these low buy updates because I don't really feel like documenting a low buy is that helpful when that person is also receiving PR because it's just not that relatable for the viewer. Even though like I think my spending would be pretty minimal as a whole, like even if I weren't receiving PR this year, I definitely think I probably would have spent more this year than I did if I hadn't received any PR. So I still wanted to finish off the low buy series because I am the type of person, like if I start something, I wanna finish it. Like I don't wanna just leave you guys hanging. Um, and I do still think it's fun to track my purchases and trends over the course of a year. I do think it's really interesting to see, but at the same time, I don't really think it's gonna make sense for me to do a dedicated low buy on my channel in 2024 because like I said, even if it weren't for the PR aspect, I, I still don't feel like I need to do a, a low buy. Like I have, like I said, I have pretty, healthy spending habits as it is thanks to doing a low buy for the last few years. And I really don't think anyone should need to do a low buy or a no buy multiple years in a row. Like ideally you do it for a year or like whatever set amount of time you learn the lessons from it and then you don't need to keep setting like strict rules for yourself anymore. The other thing is also as a YouTuber, even if again, even if we weren't taking PR into consideration, a lot of the things I buy are specifically for my channel. For example, like all of those Ulta purchases in October, <laughs> those were, most of those were for a video where I tested subscriber recommendations. If I weren't a YouTuber, I probably wouldn't have bought most of that stuff. So that's another thing, like to keep a beauty channel going, you do kind of have to 
buy makeup for the purposes of your channel. Um, and I think I can still do that in a mindful way, and I think I can still keep a curated collection. But for that reason, my spending is going to look way different than it would for someone who's not on YouTube. So that's why I just don't think a low buy is really going to be necessary for my channel in the new year, but of course I definitely still plan to do lots of content about mindful consumption and, um, you know, I'm still going to be very discerning about what I buy and what I choose to keep in my collection, and I hope that you'll be along for the ride with me, of course. But that, I think, wraps up this low buy finale for 2023, but I would love to hear in the comments below how your low buys and no buys have been going now that we're wrapping up the year and what your plans are for the new year. Are you going to be doing any sort of low buy or beauty budget, or do you feel like it's unnecessary? Let me know. Thank you guys so much for hanging out today. I hope you had fun. If you did, be sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I do also have a Patreon and a channel membership if you're interested in supporting my channel further. Otherwise, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day, and I will talk to you again very soon in my next video. Bye!